Well, good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas to you one and all. So listen, can I send out an SOS? That's uh, kind of Calvary Temple Church speaks for, would you please scoot over some. So if you have any seats like in the center of your section, maybe you could just slide over. Uh, ushers, take note, there may be a few seats yet on the end. Also, we have people in our overflow, and we want to welcome those that are in overflow as well, as well as our online audience. It's great to have you all here today as we celebrate Christmas together. Now, I want to talk to you for just a moment about why Christmas. And here's the shortest, best answer I can give you right now for why Christmas. Here it is. Because we humans are going to need a lot of forgiveness. That's why. In other words, God sent his son because we had been estranged from the God that created us in his image for millennia. And the father said, it's time that I be restored in relationship to my children. But they need forgiveness. And so when we talk about this, when we talk about Christmas, when we talk about the one whose birthday we celebrate, Jesus, he alone is the author and bringer of forgiveness to the whole human family. But it's a gift that we have to reach out and receive to be forgiven. Now, let's talk for just a few moments together about forgiveness. Really just two very simple aspects. God's forgiveness of us, first of all, and secondly, our forgiveness of each other. A vertical aspect, a horizontal aspect, and please understand this. They are tightly linked together. You can't have one without the other. Now, here's what I mean. God's forgiveness, first of all. Now, you're not going to like this. Some of you may be even downright irritated because it's so simple about how to receive God's forgiveness, but this is exactly what the Bible teaches about receiving God's forgiveness. Are you ready? Believe and receive. That's it. Believe and receive. Now, we human beings, we are incurably religious. We want to add all kinds of baggage and stupid people stuff to it. We want to create our systems and our rigid rules, and then we want to point fingers at each other and judge each other. And God says, I am so not into that. Believe in my son Jesus and receive his forgiveness for you to make you a brand new man or woman from the inside out. You say, John, believe what? Believe that Christmas is God putting on skin and becoming a human baby. That's the wonder, the miracle of Christmas. That then these 33 years later in his earthly life, he died on a cross for our sins, in your place and my place, for our personal sins. And to demonstrate that he has authority to forgive sin, three days after he was dead, he rose from the dead, and that's called the resurrection. When we believe that simple body of truth, then we reach out and receive that grace gift from God, we become instantaneously on the promise of Holy Scripture, a forgiven man or a forgiven woman. And our life whew, has begun again brand new. So that's the God forgives us piece. Let's go to the second piece, which is the our forgive each other piece. And this is where it gets a little rocky because to dwell above with those we love, that would be such glory. To dwell below with those we know is quite another story. And because it's the holiday time and you know who is coming to town, and I don't mean Santa Claus. It may be mother-in-law, it may be father-in-law, it may be a strange sister, it may be grandma. It may, you, put, you fill in the blanks for your fam. But we're all about in the same boat, right? Understand that the vertical aspect of forgiveness is closely linked with the horizontal aspect of forgiveness. Now, just in case you don't believe me, that's cool. You got to believe Jesus when he said these words. Check it out. He said, if you forgive men and women when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you of your sins. But, he concludes, if you do not forgive people their sins when they sin against you, your father will not forgive your sins either. You say, whoa, that's heavy duty. Yeah, isn't it? In other words, we can't be forgiven of our sins, but still be eaten up uh, with almost the pathology, the malignancy of revenge and hatred and just kind of a seething cauldron of bitterness. 
Because the alternative to receiving God's forgiveness and then begin to give to other people forgiveness and grace, the very same that God gave to us, what's the alternative? Here's the only alternative. It's to walk around the rest of our life being a deeply hurt person. And here is a very true adage that hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. If we're not forgiven, that is the alternative. We'll continue to walk through, and we are all actors and actresses on the stage. We very cleverly masquerade what's really going on in our internal geography. So we can hide it, we can keep it secret most of the time. We'll have our trigger points. Most of the time we can keep it stuffed. Because most people in this room have been or will be at some point in life, or at many points, deeply hurt by someone else. Has that happened to you yet? It's probably happened to all of us a number of times. So what we have to decide is what we're going to do with it. And here's the thing. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. Here's the thing Jesus said. Those whom I have forgiven must themselves forgive. I didn't say it. He said it. Forgiveness sets the captive free only to discover that the prisoner is me. We imprison ourselves with rage, bitterness, hatred, resentment, revenge, whatever may be going on in our lives, deep levels of hostility. See, bitterness and unforgiveness, it's like taking poison, hoping the other person dies. We don't kill the other person. Many times, they don't even know we're so angry at him. We kill ourselves. We strangle and choke off all possibility of being emotionally healthy people and spiritually healthy people when we, when we live that way. Now, let's talk very quickly about why we should forgive each other and how we can forgive each other. First of all, the big why question. Uh, the first response I'd say to why should I forgive is because God has forgiven us, me and you. Nothing can compare with what God has forgiven us relative to the magnitude of what we need to forgive each other of doing to us or against us. Secondly, because resentment doesn't work. Back to that alternative, those of you who have chosen to cap and seal and stuff, how's that resentment thing working out for you in your life? You go to bed with it every night, probably the last thought in your mind when your head's on your pillow, you're thinking those thoughts, rehearsing them again and again and again, and then you drift off into a fitful sleep. You awaken with those resentment and hatreds and angers in the morning. You carry them through the day, and you might get so busy in your work that you can forget about them for an hour, half a day, whatever, but there will be a trigger. There will be something, a picture, a sound, a smell, a sight, a name that will once again cause all of that, like a bile, to rush to the fore of our internal lives. How's that resentment thing working out for you? We're talking about why we should forgive, and here's the simple answer. Secondly, because resentment doesn't work. There's a third one, and it goes this way. Because you and I will ourselves need forgiveness in the future. And God says, what I want you to do, kids, I want you to give to each other what I have given to you. That's what God's saying. Now, let's wrap it up by talking about how we should forgive. First of all, we got to recognize that we are all imperfect. You know what most ticks us off? Somebody who manifests in their temperament, their personality, the exact same traits we have in our own temperament. And that's what pride does. Pride blinds us. Pride discerns a fault in other people and excuses that very same fault in ourselves. And it blinds us. It's the craziest thing in the world. I think that's why Jesus said, hey guys, he said, you know, before you go after that little itty bitty speck in your brother's eye, Take the whopping log out of your own eye. He's saying deal with your own stuff first before you start accusing and judging and micromanaging other people. We need to recognize that we're all imperfect and to live is to be hurt and get hurt. So let me give you an example this way. How do you get hurt in any relationship? Just have a relationship with that person long enough. How do you get hurt in any marriage? Just be married 
to that person long enough. And, and here's a clue, not always, but often, changing marriage partners is not usually the answer because they won't have, the new marriage partner won't have all the issues of the last marriage partner that annoyed you so badly. No, no, they'll have a whole new set for you, <laughs> gift wrap, that you now get to figure out over the next two or three decades. That's how it works. How do you get hurt in any job? Just work at that job long enough. Your colleagues, your coworkers, your bosses, or whatever, they'll tick you off. How do you even get hurt in any church? Just go there long enough. I mean, I realize it's the weekend before Christmas. For some of you, and I say this good-naturedly, we might be church three or four or seven or 19 or 25 on your list because you're hunting for the perfect church, which is approximately as perfect as you are. And then you'll be happy. And we both know that doesn't exist because every church has a lot of something called imperfect people. How should we forgive? We've got to relinquish our desire to get even. If you have missed everything else I've said, please remember this one life insight, and it goes this way. Forgiveness is me giving up the right to hurt you for hurting me. That's forgiveness. Let me say it again. Forgiveness is me giving up the right. We think it's our right, our prerogative. Giving up the right to hurt you for hurting me. When we get that, when we understand that we can begin with God's help to release it and be whole and clean again. You say, well, John, how long am I going to have to practice these forgiveness feelings? Here's the answer. As long as you experience them. But the more you practice daily forgiveness, so you've forgiven this person that did you honestly a legitimate injustice. You forgive them. You'll think about it probably two or three times later that day and certainly by the next day. And then stop whatever you're doing and saying, Father, okay, so I'm angry again. And yesterday I agreed that I was going to move forward in you and release my hostility at that person. I'm not going to even try to fix that circumstance I now give them what you've given me. I give it grace. I give it forgiveness. And I need your help again today to do that. And Father, I may also need your help again tomorrow. See, we continue to live out that forgiveness. And then every hour becomes every day. And then every day becomes only once a week. And once a week will become once a month. And then pretty soon we will truly, in actuality, be free. There's a third, how should we forgive? And it's this. Respond to evil with good. In other words, overcome evil, Jesus taught us, with good. Not new laws, not new whatever, just be doers of great good. There's a fourth, and it's this. Refocus on God's purpose for our lives. When we live out hostility, rage, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, we are like a train that becomes derailed. We get off the rails, and we have this massive catastrophic train wreck. When we forgive as God's forgiven us, it's like the train of our life gets back on the rails and we can begin once again to make forward progress. But until we do, we are an emotional, psychological, spiritual train wreck. When we understand the transforming power of his forgiveness in our lives, when we can extend it to other people, we can actually learn to love like we have never been hurt. I want to encourage you this Christmas weekend to do the unthinkable. Please do the unthinkable. Forgive and be forgiven. Three kings bearing gifts. From afar. Melchior, Balthazar. Gaspar. They were astrologers. They were wise men. They came from the east. Bearing the gift of gold to identify Jesus as king. Bearing the gift of frankincense to identify Jesus as a priest. Bearing the gift of myrrh to identify Jesus as savior. Three, Three kings, kings bearing, bearing gifts. gifts. We are not kings, <laughs> we are not wise men. And we are not from so far away. But, but we, we come, come bearing, bearing gifts. gifts. 
One second. One second. One second. What, What would, would you, you do, do with three, three seconds? seconds? I would have said yes. I would have said no. I wouldn't have said anything at all. I would have stopped. I would have never started. I would have kept on going. I would have never opened that door. I would have never gotten into that car. I would have never turned my back. If you could spend one second to relive a single moment that could change your life, what would that be worth to you? How much would you pay for that? What's the value of second, second chances? chances? It was a split second. My dad and I were cutting brush, and this log snapped, hit him on the side of the head, throwing him off the ground, slamming him against this rock. He never knew what hit him. It was the heat of the moment. He just pushed the wrong button and I said some things. Some terrible things. I guess that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't know where he went, and I haven't seen him since. I would do anything for one more chance. I remember the moment I started smoking. I was so sick. You would have thought I would have learned my lesson after that. But all my friends were doing it, and I guess I was just trying to fit in. I don't know. But now I can't stop. I shouldn't be surprised. I mean, it's not like I didn't know the risk. I just wish I never would have started. The mistake most people would make is to waste their time trying to change the past. Instead of investing it in the future. Take the gift of three seconds. And make it an eternity. That's, That's the, the gift, gift of God, God at, at Christmas. Christmas. Kairos became Kronos. Infinity became a moment. Time stops. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You, you will be, be forgiven. forgiven. And Kronos becomes Kairos. And a moment becomes infinity. And time begins again. Three, Three seconds. seconds. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me, please? I believe for a whole bunch of you, this, this is your moment. And I would love to close by praying for you, if I may do that. So with your heads bowed, let me just ask you, are you ready by simple faith to believe and to receive? The Christ of Christmas is your forgiver the lover of your soul, the one who will wash you clean and make you brand new. If that's what's going on in your heart right now, raise your hand high and hold it up all over the room. That's right, just raise it up high. Hands everywhere. Just put your hand up and keep it up, would you please? Put your hand up and keep it up if that's you. Is there anybody else? Many hands are raised. Is there anybody else? So, Father, for these men and women who've raised their hand this morning, would you come in with your amazing, transforming grace and make them clean from the inside out? Do what only you can do. Forgive them and begin relationship with them, God. I pray that they begin to, right now to be filled with a whole new peace and hope and sense of well-being, the likes of which they've never yet experienced. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said...